when I look at firearms, I look at, you know, we have to cover our costs, right? Because right. you have to make some money. And then I look at, we have to have a little bit of markup to invest in the next thing. And then, so we put a price on it, and that's the price. And I know what it costs to make things. And a lot of people will say, well, PSA sells. They're selling cheap. They're cutting some kind of corners. No, the, the actual answer is everybody else is making boatloads of money. I don't think that you really need to do that. I don't think you should ask, you know, why are we selling so cheap? The real question is, why are some companies trying to make so much on one handgun? I get it. They're doing a a lot of marketing and everything, but I know what it costs to make the gun. Like, we make it. We make our barrel. We make our frame. Well, we don't make our frame. We we contract that, but we make the barrel. We make the slide. We make most of the parts except for stampings and polymer. We don't do that. But I know what we pay for them is not terribly much. And I look at what people are selling a gun for, like you're keeping people out of the hobby. And I'm trying to get people in. So there is that we have to cover our costs and we have to have some markup. And the markup generally is to invest in the next project, right? Past that, we are not publicly traded. We don't have to return. It's me, Ed, and Julian. Ed, we joke about him. He's the coolest redneck you'll ever meet. <laughs> great construction guy. Great to have on board. And Julian and I are just... Huge gun guys, right? And so our thing is if we can get more people to buy because it's a more reasonable price point, spread more freedom, that's what we would rather do. Dagger's a fantastic gun. I could sell it for a lot more. We could make a lot more money, and, you know, I could have flown my private jet here. <laughs> <laughs> Instead, I drove, you know. Uh, but, you know, I, I just think that if we're going to follow our vision, which is to spread as much freedom, we don't need to mark everything up a ridiculous amount. And that's kind of just been our vision. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for that, right? Because we have been discussing new gun owners and people who are so... Um, we talk about the on-ramp. Here, I'll rephrase this. We talk about the on-ramp to the Second Amendment, getting involved in the Second Amendment community through advocacy, through owning a firearm, through training, and there is often a cost prohibition on that, right? Where people just don't have the funds, but they find themselves in a situation where they are trying to defend themselves, trying to defend their families. And whatever you spend on your firearm, you are assigning a certain amount of value to your own life of saying, you know, I'm going to defend myself. I'm willing to defend myself. And this is the tool and this is the price that it takes to acquire that tool. And with everything going on in the world and with all of the new gun owners, it is so mission critical to the success of the Second Amendment that people are able to get a quality product at a low price because everything else in the world right now cost so much more than it did even two years ago to the point where a lot of families are struggling and a lot of people might not have the funding necessary to go buy, you know, a, a $3,000 handgun, um, even though it's bright, shiny, and fantastic. Well, I think our daggers are bright, shiny, and fantastic. <laughs> But I agree, that, but, <laughs> but that's just me. So, but, 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 but that again comes back to the, the vision and the mission, which is to spread freedom. So, you know, um, like I said, make them fun, make them affordable, and, you know, you'll get more of them out there. So, we have Jamin with Palmetto State Army. Jamin, how are you today? Pretty good. How are you? Good. Can you give us a little bit of backstory about you and, you know, the backstory of PSA, which is the largest or one of the largest gun store slash manufacturers in the country. It's the largest or this the number one firearms and accessories website in the world. That's amazing. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, kind of an interesting story. Let's see. I got back from my second deployment. Um, I'm a CPA by trade, by you know, education. And I got back, and I had taken a couple IED blasts on my second um, deployment direct hits. And I came back with it's a traumatic brain injury, but turns into like a really, really bad concussion. And I came back and I basically got adult ADD. And so like I went from being able to do, you know, very complex tax returns for large corporations and, you know, estate and trust and everything worked to 
I would sit down, look at my monitor, and 15 minutes later, I couldn't, just couldn't do it. I couldn't focus anymore. It's like a severe adult ADD. So I did, I did it when I got back. I did it for about a year and a half, and I just got to the point. I was like, I can't do this. So I quit, but I took a job at another firm. And I was like, well, maybe this firm just sucks, right? <laughs> I was like, maybe, maybe, maybe I need a new firm. So I was there about a year, and I was like, I can't do this. So I just I quit my job, told my wife, you know, hey, uh, we're going to start a gun company. And she was very <laughs> upset because <laughs> we had helped each other through college. So, uh, you know, she was like, well, why did I, you know, I have six years of college. And, you know, we met when I was in the Army enlisted. I was 17 when we met. And uh, so, you know, and we went through this journey. I got out of the Army. We put each other through college. So she was very upset. You know, we got to this point, and uh, And now you're quitting your job. And then, trust me, this is going to work out. This is going to be great. <laughs> She's very skeptical. So she obviously kept her job. I taught at the University of South Carolina in the evenings, and I was – in the National Guard as company commander, so they, they would let me come in more during the week to try and get some extra money. But I quit my full-time job, had those part-time jobs, and it was me. And I talked to my brother who was managing a shoe store. Of course, there's all these you know, jokes about managing a stu- <laughs> shoe store and Al Bundy and everything. And I was like, don't have to be Al Bundy anymore. We're going to start a gun company. And so he's like, okay. So after about a month, convinced him to quit. And we started, the, the idea, the first idea was there was a company called Silver State Armory. They were in Nevada, and they made 6.8 ammo, and I didn't, I, I was critical. with. I thought the 6.8 round could really take off. I was kind of critical of what they were doing. So I was like, we're going to start the Palmetto State Armory to compete, compete with the Silver State Armory, and we're going to make ammo, we're going to make ammo better. And um, the only problem was once we got into, my brother and I got into, like, how in the world do you make ammo and the licenses and the equipment? Like we probably should have thought that first, but we didn't at all. We just were going to do it. And it was very expensive and the licensing was very complex and the regulations. So we had both quit our jobs and we were talking, we're like, okay, what do we do? I said, well, Magpul has this new PMAG. Why don't we get some of those and we'll put them on our website. So the CPA firm that I quit at, I was still friends with the IT guy there. And we sat at a sandwich shop, set up the palmettostatearmory.com website. And he showed me, like, okay, if you want to put something on, you do that, you know, showed us how to do it. So we caught my brother and I, we got some P mags and we put them on the website. So we were selling P mags. And that was it. And then kind of got into other things. But that's kind of the story of how it all got started. And that was 2008, 2009. Yeah. So that was roughly like 14, 15 years ago. Yeah. How has the growth been since then? I mean, you guys went from that to like well, I number have one. A lot of gray hair now. <laughs> <laughs> when I first started, people were like, "Wow, you're so young." Now they're just like, "Yeah, well, <laughs> you look about right." <laughs> so it's um, it's been hectic. It's been a lot of fun, and it's been very challenging. Um, the growth. So when we first started, I remember our first sale was in April of 2008. We formed the company in. February of 2008. Our first sale was April because we went through like 60 days of trying to figure out, like, what are we going to do? Okay, we can't just immediately make an ammo plant. And in fact, it wouldn't be until a decade later that we would start an ammo plant. And so the idea of the PMAX and all that, it was April 2008, $221 in sales. And I was like, <laughs> this is great. Well, I mean, not going to live off of that, but we got something. And then just the website just started. It started like slowly taking off. So, and then we started advertising on air15.com. So, I think next month we did like 7,000 in sales. And it was like a, just a steady, you know, 7,000, 15,000. You know, we're like, okay, we're getting some success here. And so, it, the summers in the industry are incredibly slow. So, what happens is if you own a bunch of inventory that you bought in the busy season, you probably overpaid for it. And you're sitting with a lot of in the summer looking for cash. So we hadn't really bought much inventory except for a couple of magazines. And so that summer, so it was like June, July of 2008, my brother and I, we had basically gotten like sort of a small inheritance. It wasn't crazy, but it was enough to start a company. And so he put his money in, I put my money in, and we were like calling people up, hey, we want to buy whatever, right? And we have some cash, we'll pay cash and we'll... So we had amassed a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of good items, you know, a bunch of magazines. Um, we had purchased some pervy ammunition. We called them up. 
and they sold us, you know, probably like 10 pallets. And, but it was, it was slow. And so we started selling that and we would, we would, the orders were going, you know, 15,000 a month and 25,000 or so. And then we, by the time we hit like November of 2008, we were doing like a million dollars a month at like really good margin. And it was turning <laughs> really fast. We're like, holy cow, this is nuts, right? And then like the next like couple, like year or so, it just kept growing because Obama got elected. And you know, of course, we were all rightfully concerned about losing our rights. And then it kind of crested and it like died off. And so then we were sitting there and we had, we were doing this, I had a 50 acre farm and the Northeast side of Columbia. And so we had no overhead, right? Um, we were just doing, we had a pole barn and really big garage. So, and we weren't taking any salaries. We, had, we really had zero overhead. So um, it was all profit. All the market was profit. We put it back into new products. Well, when it slowed down, everybody had made so much money, they didn't care about like cutting their losses on some extra inventory. So we took the money that we had and we started saying, okay, well now we're going to be a deal website. So we'll, uh, so if you have anything and you're overstocked on whatever, we'll buy it from you cash. And then we'll, so say something's like selling it 40 bucks and you pay 20 for it. Well, we'll give you cash. We'll buy it, take it off your hands for like, say 15 and we'll sell it for 20. So we turned from, we pivoted cause it wasn't real busy to a deal website. And we thought we were rolling with that pretty good. And, um, and we were just really doing mags and ammo that we could get our hands on. And, you know, cause like Winchester wouldn't ship us a truckload of ammo, not to my <laughs> garage. Right. So, and then, um, and then there's a company called DS arms out of Illinois. We bought, there was a magazine called the Fusel magazine and it was like solid steel. I mean, literally it was like a brick. You could kill somebody with it. <laughs> and, um, they were selling because every magazine was selling until they weren't. And they had like pallets of these things. And the guy's name was Mark Christensen. He called, he's like, hey, I know you guys, like, do deals on your website. You know, will you take a couple of pallets of these mags? And I was like, okay, but we're not going to pay anywhere close to what you paid for them. So like, that's fine. We just want to get rid of them. So we bought a pallet, and they did okay. So I was like, okay, we'll get another pallet. And on that other pallet, there was a box of buffer tubes on it, like for an AR-15. And it was about the same size as the box of the magazine. So we were opening up the boxes so yeah, there's buffer tubes in here. And I called Mark. I was like, hey, you sent us some buffer tubes by accident. He's like, well, just keep them. And we had our first employee. We had one employee that worked for us. Still works for us 14 years later. Um, his name's Jonathan. He's like, well, we should put that on our website. Okay. So put it on the website. Sold that day. It's like, so I called him back. I was like, hey, how much do these cost? It's $10. We put them up for 20 So like, well, that's a really good margin. So, so we bought some more and put them up. I was like, they are 15 parts. Sell really, really well. And so I was like, okay, what other part can I get? And so we just kept, we just kept adding, you know, call up Mark. What do you, what do you have? And then I start calling up other companies, figuring out people really like AR-15 parts. So that kind of went on for a little while. Um, and then the next big thing was, so we, we did pretty well. Things kind of leveled off and we were actually pretty happy. I think we started paying ourselves salaries and it was like a cool experiment. And then, so Joe Wilson yelled, you lie, at Obama. I don't know if you remember that or not. So he's giving his State of the Union address, and he gets up and he yells, you lie, right? And he's, like, <laughs> all angry and everything. Well, it, well, what happened was we did a lower that we had contracted out because we had started getting lowers brand new with our name. We weren't making them at the time. Now we make, you know, thousands a day. But at the time, we were having someone else make them for us. And, um, and so we had one with the serial number ULI and we put some like engraving on it and everything. And so we only made like a hundred of them. However, there's a local newspaper that picked up on, it's called the free times. It's not in business anymore. It's like the posting courier now. And that guy was like asking me about it. And, and so it was like really not a big deal. We were selling a couple in the stores. I think we put like 20 online. And so that guy called the Huffington post who called the New York Times, and, like, it was, like, everywhere, assassin rifle, right? And I was <laughs> like, what the heck? This was a joke, right? And um, and so, because he's our congressman in South Carolina. So um, so then the New York Times, Huffington Post, every whacked-out liberal website that has a ton of web traffic linked into our website, and what that does on your website, is depending on what links in, 
it creates more web traffic because your searches become relevant. So if you're searching for something, we might be on page 10. Well, now that we're in with the New York Times, like we're <laughs> the whole website got re-indexed. So we were selling, you know, decent amount to like just killing it. And we're like, whoa, what in the world happened? This is nuts. And um, that was like the next catalyst to the next level. So our web traffic is kind of like going like this is a shot like straight up. So we were like, wow, this is cool. So we tried to do another one. We called it the Nobo. It was like the Nobo 12, like no Obama 12. And like, we were like, we're going to have this go again. And the media wouldn't bite. It never really went anywhere. We're trying to get them <laughs> criticize us again. So from, so it was kind of an interesting experience. And then, um, I know it's big, big thing. And then we got to a point where, you know, we wanted to start making things ourselves. Oh, I'll give you another story. So we had, we had been selling the parts for a little while that other people made, but we didn't have a barrel supplier, like at all. And because uh, I was a sim, like, we didn't make anything. I was having other people make the parts for us, or they were selling us parts. I don't know if they're actually making them, but uh, we had a lower now made with our logo on it. We had most of the parts except a barrel. Well, we had a guy who worked at the first our first store was 200 Business Park in Columbia. It was the front end of our our warehouse. And, um, in fact, the warehouse, it was our first warehouse that we built. It got us out of our garage. We built, bought this warehouse. And the front office area, people were, would start to knock on the door. Hey, I, I ordered online. Can I pick it up? Or I know this is your website. Can I come in and shop? So we took it. was like 900 square feet. And we knocked down the walls and put in some shelves. And that ended up being our first store. Well, that store was not too far from FN in Columbia. It's right down the road from it. So we had FN employees. They would send the guns in there to do the transfers. And then some of them work for us part-time in the evenings for extra money. And so we had this one FN employee. His name was Chuck Norris. Obviously not his real name. <laughs> Don't remember his real name. But he went by Chuck Norris. And um, he would work there. And so in order to leave the building, I would be back in the warehouse. It was a big warehouse in the back. And, um, you know, walk through the front area where the store was and, you know, say goodnight to everybody. Hey, I'm heading out. I was like five, six, whatever. And, um, and so he said to me one time we're walking out, he's like, hey, I need a full-time job here. FN just lost the military contract. And I was like, well, that could be interesting. We don't have barrels. You guys have a massive barrel shop. Um, well, tell them we're going to buy the barrels. Tell them we'll take over where the military left off. Of course, like not realizing the volume and quantity <laughs> and all that stuff. And um, he's like, yeah, I'll let them know. So the, the very next day, um, Chuck Norris is there, and I walk through. And um, Jean-Pierre, the Belgian guy who runs the barrel shop, is there doing a transfer. And they called him JP. And Chuck Norris is like, hey, there's JP. And I was like, who's JP? He's like, the guy that runs the barrel shop that you talked about yesterday. I was like, okay, cool. Um, so, hey, we want to buy all your barrels, take over. Because they were doing layoffs. And um, we're like, hey, let's take over that business. And he's like, well, that's a lot of barrels. Like, we're a big company. <laughs> like, I mean, we, we absolutely were not. But, you know, we were very arrogant at the time. So, uh, in the meantime, um, Julian Wilson, who is Joe Wilson's son, this is after the ULI incident. We had been friends in college. We'd done Clemson ROTC together. He had bought in and become an owner. And then Ed LaRock, because we were doing construction projects and working with contractors was terrible. So, we, Julian was like, hey, if we're going to do this big, we need a contractor to be on board. So, that born into JJ Capital, Jamin, Julian, and Ed. So it was me, and then they brought my brother out, my brother's Josiah, who you've talked to. He still works for the company. He's not an owner. But so they bought Josiah out, and that turned into JJE, Jamin, Julian, and Ed. And Julian is, you know, Joe Wilson's son, the congressman of Yale, you lie. He wasn't an owner at the time, but now he is. So uh, Julian's dad, Joe Wilson, had had some connection with FN. I think they presented him a gun at some point and everything. Um, being the congressman, and Ed had worked at FN for years in the Chrome shop before he started became a general contractor, and now he was our general contractor for our business. In fact, when you go to the Myrtle Beach store, which isn't too far from here, beautiful facility, you're going to love it. Well, Ed did all that. He took the old McClatchy newspaper printing building and turned it into probably the nicest gun store in the country. Ed's fantastic, good to have on board. So we go over there, and we have John Pierre, J.P., he interested John Louis, who's the CEO of FN, and um, and they're talking to Julian like your dad's the guy we gave the gun to, and like hey Ed, good to see you. You worked here, and so 
ignorantly, they were like, yeah, sold. You want all the barrels you got? You know, we'll make you every barrel you want. And we're like, yeah, we want those. <laughs> and um, so I remember, and I probably, they probably don't want to hear this because we still buy a lot of stuff from them. But we had like a little van. We'd go over and pick it up, and it would just, you put pallets of barrels. The van was like dragging the ground, coming back over <laughs> to place. And I remember the first shipment we picked up was like $400,000. And we, we were not that big at all. In fact, I pulled the numbers and went, why do we do that, right? <laughs> so, but we were trying to build guns, and we were building, like, one or two a day, and uppers just a small handful a day. And, um, and I remember, I think it was, like, August, and then by September, you have 30-day terms on it. They were, like, ready to do another ship, and they called me, like, hey, you know, you've paid, like, half of this. Like, please send the other half. I'm like, well, yeah, that's, we'll send that out right away. But then they had sent another shipment. <laughs> like, wow, this is a lot. And, you know, and talking to the guys, trying to figure out, you know, maybe we need to cut back on this. And then um, sales did start to pick up into the fall, so we paid it. But they were shipping you know, way more. And I remember somewhere around, like, November, because I, I thought, well, we got Black Friday coming up. You know, we'll be we'll be okay. We had way more. And, and they called again, like, hey, you're a little late on your payment. We're getting a little nervous. And um and so we didn't cry uncle just because I didn't want the to hurt the relationship with FN, but we were just swimming in these barrels, right? Well then unfortunately Sandy Hook happened and we were, you know, one of the only companies with a large stockpile of barrels. And then that really launched our AR fifteen line because we had all the other pieces and and you know, um we were able to have product available in a very unfortunate time for the country um, to, to sell. And so that was, I think, December of 2012. And, um, you know, and then FN continued to sell, to help us out, sending more barrels, and it turned into a really strong relationship. They started making more products for us, and we, you know, we still buy from them today. So that's kind of a little bit of a history. There's so much more, but I don't want to take over the whole. <laughs> you ask some of the history, that's that's some of the history. No, that's great to know because I was going to ask, like, when did you guys start doing complete guns? Um, and you kind of answered that. With with your complete guns, I mean, what what's a normal day for a builder at your facility look like to put out an upper like are we talking like well, we 10 do, uppers a day or are we talking we, like we we do and it depends on the upper we're doing about 2,000 uppers a day oh and roughly I mean that's just AR-15 of course we do you know probably and again we do a lot of our stuff so we're like a build it yourself company right and we do sell complete guns but so most of ours are sold you know customer will buy a receiver and then they'll buy a kit to build it themselves. Same thing with our handguns. So like our daggers and rocks, people generally will like to buy the frame, and then they'll buy the parts to build it because, it, first of all, it's fun. Second of all, you get to get the features that you want. So we don't sell 2,000 AR-15s a day, but we sell 2,000 uppers a day. So somebody might buy like another brand lower and assemble it. So I think lowers were well over 1,000 a day on lowers we sell more uppers and kits than we do actual lowers just because people buy other brand lowers and assemble them so we're about two thousand a day there about a thousand a day of handguns it's so about three thousand a day again they're done differently people will buy like our dagger frame and build it with a slide or they'll buy you know polymer 80 or set or whatever brand but we sell just tons of the slides and the parts and the barrels when it comes to you guys, let me start with uh, parts for the website. When it comes to, like, parts for the website and things that you go, what? There's hundreds of new accessories and cool guy stuff coming out every year. Where do you go, okay, we're going to buy this or we're going to buy that? Or what, what goes into adding products to your website? So there's two sides to that. One is our products. And so, and I'll kind of do a little journey from where we were with FN to where we are now. We got to the point for, a, it was a birthday party that I had, and the CEO of, um, of the company, it was a major supplier, couldn't make it because his private jet had maintenance issues. And I was thinking, <laughs> I don't have a private jet. I should probably have a private jet, but I don't. So clearly they're making way more money than we are. So I was like, we're going to start making products. 
And it was really the next evolution of the company. We went from assembling products to making products. And we, we, um, we did it some by starting manufacturing businesses and some we acquired. So we make about a million BCGs a year. We make about 1.2 million barrels a year. We, made, we just started making everything, right? And then from there, we wanted to go from we're making it every year and, and, of course, we make and we supply other companies, too. It's not all for our consumption. But, like, say you have an AR-15 company or want to start one, you can call us up. We'll sell you BCGs. And we do that for a lot of people. So, and in any other part that they're looking for. So, the, uh, the next step for us was, well, we wanted not just assemble things. We don't want to just make things. We want to come out with new stuff. So, that's where the Jackal came in. The Jackal was kind of a pet project of mine. The Jackal... You've got the rock, the five seven rock, and for people wondering, why did you call it the rock? Well, Ed, the E and JJ, his last name's La Rock, and his nickname is Rock, so we just <laughs> named it after him. We were in a meeting one time. He goes, "I want a gun named after me." I'm like, "All right, well, you get the next one." So that's why it's the five seven rock. And um, you know, so we really wanted to innovate, and I think everyone will see at the shot show this year that we are the absolute king of innovation. I can't disclose, but it will be the most baller shot show ever. Like, I mean. <laughs> Literally, like, decades worth of innovation released at one show. Um, so so we, ha- we have two different tracks to answer your, your question about what do we pick to go on the website. We have teams that pick what we're going to make new for our products to put on the website. And those are design, branding, all kinds of different, you know, engineering teams. We have 50 full-time engineers that are just constantly working on new products. Uh, and then, you know, you have an engineer that can make the most brilliant product design ever but it's not manufacturable so we have manufacturing engineers and efficiency engineers and everything. that team works on our stuff and then we have what's called a business intelligence division and we're still working on that so sometimes we get so hunkered down on our stuff we'll miss a really cool new product that someone else is making and you know we want to put that on our website so we're trying to get better at business intelligence but that is the department that decides, like, it's a new product that's out. Other people are selling it. We need to sell it, too. And that is the absolute beauty of what we do. So people, like, I mean, to some of the industry, they don't understand this, right? And you think about it. Would you ever go to Ruger to buy a PSA product? No. No. But would you come to PSA to buy a Ruger product? Yeah. Yeah. What a conundrum. And the thing is, we've gotten to the point where we're one of the largest retailers of our competitor's product. So we've created this thing where we're the number one source to buy our stuff and most of the other brands too. So it's really turned into quite an animal. And like I said, the nice thing is you get to work all day and spread freedom. <laughs> and it's really cool. And we, ha- we try to figure out what is our vision? What are we trying to do? Are we trying to be the biggest? Are we trying to be, you know, the most innovative uh, while those are great to be the biggest, most innovative, if we can, our vision is to spread freedom, right? And the way I look at it, so I don't know if you guys know about the 1986 machine gun ban. Oh, so, yeah. so I was a kid, and I used to go to a couple gun shops. One was called Don's Guns, one was called Edelman's. I'm from Philadelphia or outside of Philadelphia. Don's Gun Shop, Edelman's, which ironically the guy who owned that ended up starting Kimber several years after he shut that down. And then there was another one called Target World. And I would go in there, and they had these, you had all the guns in the regular racks, and then they had these cabinets that were highly secure, and it was like $6,000 for an M16. I'm like, why is that $6,000? Because they banned them, and they're hard to find. Of course, I wish I had bought all of them at (laughs) $6,000. And I remember thinking, like, well, why didn't somebody register, like, millions of them before that happened? And then there would be more available. So that's really the way we looked at all of this, is, like, all these freedoms could be taken away at any point. So if the vision of our company is to spread freedom, we want to make sure that, you know, if it ever happens and we're like, wow, today was the last day. We didn't expect it. Well, we did our best to get as much freedom out there as possible. Instead of just looking at everything as a business decision, like when it's slow, the Trump slump and everything. Well, we had machines making lowers and we could have made a decision like, we're not really going to make hardly any money if we sell them at twenty nine ninety nine. Actually, you're just sort of just turning money and, You can make a decision like, okay, well, we could lay the people off and stop making them until it comes back. But we made the decision like, no, it's important. Even if we lose a little bit of money, 
to get as much freedom out there. So we kept everything going. We kept everything running. And we just adjusted the prices because I thought, you know, $30, you're going to get people into the hobby that weren't even going to do it because the, the price of entry is so low. And so, and we did that. We were, we were able to grow, you know, spread more freedom, grow the hobby. And, you know, the AR-15 is like a gateway drug for, for guns because you <laughs> build one. And so you think like a 308 hunting rifle, of course, we all have them or most people have them. You shoot it like once a year, right? You know, sell your rifle in, drop a deer, call it a day, right? Well, AR-15, it looks at you and it talks to you and it's like, build me different. Get another <laughs> lower. Like the lowers, they sit in your safe and they're like, you need a long range AR. And then you do that. And then another one looks at you and says, I should be a pistol AR. And so you're like, I got to do that. And you can't ignore your lowers, right? <laughs> so like, it's just fantastic how, you know, and it gets people into the hobby and building, building guns is cool. Cause a lot of people, they, they, they put more into building them than they do shooting them. And it's great because you think about it, it's fun. You know, there's more people who like to shoot now because of it. It gets people into the hobby. It, it's fun because not everybody, like say you live in an apartment and, you know, an urban area, you don't get to shoot as much, but you can build the guns. And to me, that's like, it's like Legos. And it gets people into new designs, like a dagger, like the original dagger we released had no optics cut, just sort of like a, you know, more squarish um, style slide. Well, if you bought the original one, you want to upgrade to all the newest, latest, and greatest. Well, just buy the parts on the website and you can tinker with it. And we've tried to make the guns fun. In fact, one of the big things we have at the SHOT Show this year is we have, there's several, you know, the, the pistol, mainly based on the Glock Gen 3 design, has become extremely Lego-like, right? Buying accessories and parts and upgrades. AR-15s like that, well, we are taking two other sections of the gun market and we're going to do the same thing because we feel like we can get more people into it which you think about it you know someone who buys this a hobby is perfect this is more freedom that's out there so if there ever is a ban like i said there'll just be so much freedom that it will have hopefully minimal effect yeah yeah because there's some other guns out there that people are coming out with that are like legos and i'm i'm guessing that's where you're going to head at um when you drop the dagger, which was 2018. No, no, seven? it was, it was mm. 2020. I was think 20, 20, I think 2018, 2019 shot show. We teased it, but I think yeah. 2020 was when it actually, when did, when you're coming up with an, uh, a pistols design, um, there's a lot of money that goes into R and D and things like that. What made you go? This is the price point we want to be at. Cause you were beating everybody at price point. Uh, and that's with all your stuff. You guys are beating okay. every bit. So personally. there is a, in that full disclosure, I'm yeah. a CPA. So <laughs> if I start nerding out on numbers, <laughs> someone throws something at me. Right? <laughs> I'm going to do that. So, all right. When I look at firearms, I look at, you know, we have to cover our costs, right? Because right. you have to make some money. And then I look at, we have to have a little bit of markup to invest in the next thing. And then, so we put a price on it and that's the price. And I know what it costs to make things. And a lot of people will say, well, PSA sales, they're selling cheap. They're cutting some kind of corners. No, the, the actual answer is everybody else is making boatloads of money. I don't think that you really need to do that. I don't think you should ask, you know, why are we selling so cheap? The real question is, why are some companies trying to make so much on one hand? And I get it. They're doing a, a lot of marketing and everything. But I know what it costs to make the gun. Like we make it. We make our barrel. We make our... Frame, well, we don't make our frame. We, we contract that, but we make the barrel. We make the slide. We make most of the parts except for stampings and polymer. We don't do that. But I know what we pay for them is not terribly much. And I look at what people are selling a gun for. Like, you're keeping people out of the hobby. And I'm trying to get people in. So there is that we have to cover our costs. And we have to have some markup. And the markup generally is to invest in the next project, right? Past that, we are not publicly traded. We don't have to return. It's me, Ed, and Julian. Ed, we joke about him. He's the coolest redneck you'll ever meet. <laughs> great construction guy. Great to have on board. And Julian and I are just huge gun guys, right? And so our thing is if we can get more people to buy because it's a more reasonable price point, spread more freedom, that's what we would rather do. Dagger's a fantastic gun. I could sell it for a lot more. We could make a lot more money and... You know, I could have flown my private jet here <laughs> instead I drove, you know. Uh, but, you know, I, I just think that 
if we're going to follow our vision, which is to spread as much freedom, we don't need to mark everything up a ridiculous amount. And that's kind of just been our vision. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for that, right? Because we have been discussing new gun owners and people who are so... Um, we talk about the on-ramp, y'all. I'll rephrase this. We talk about the on-ramp to the Second Amendment, getting involved in the Second Amendment community through advocacy, through owning a firearm, through training. And there is often a cost prohibition on that, right? Where people just don't have the funds, but they find themselves in a situation where they are trying to defend themselves, trying to defend their families. And whatever you spend on your firearm, you are assigning a certain amount of value to your own life of saying, you know, I'm going to defend myself. I'm willing to defend myself. And this is the tool and this is the price that it takes to acquire that tool. And with everything going on in the world and with all of the new gun owners, it is so mission critical to the success of the Second Amendment that people are able to get a quality product at a low price because everything else in the world right now costs so much more than it did even two years ago to the point where a lot of families are struggling and a lot of people might not have the funding necessary to go buy, you know, a a $3,000 handgun, um, even though it's bright, shiny, and fantastic. Well, I think our daggers are bright, shiny, and fantastic. But I agree, that, but, <laughs> but that's just me. So, but, 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 but that again comes back to the the vision and the mission, which is to spread freedom. So, you know, um, like I said, make them fun, make them affordable, and you know, you'll get more of them out there. What people don't understand, like, is that that the price point affordable guns are ninety percent of the market. So you have, you know, the way the way I look at the slice of the pie is. You have three percent of guns. People can charge that ten, fifteen thousand, like a Barrett M eighty two or whatever. We're selling <laughs> them now. This like military contract over on seventeen thousand dollars. Like, who's gonna buy that, right? Yeah. Well, some people do. That's maybe two to three percent. Or your Knights Armament, fantastic guns. You know they're crazy expensive. That's like two to three percent of the market. And then the other, there. So there's like two side. Ninety percent is your price point stuff, and then ten percent is like your higher end. That two to three percent of that ten percent is like legit unicorn type stuff, right? You can't really build a company based on that. And the people that get in there, like the Barrett M eighty two, totally baller gun. They they I mean, they invented a great gun, they have military contracts. You're not gonna base a company, you know, as far as a retail company based on that, because you can only sell so many, right? And then you got the other seven percent, that's like your little bit higher end stuff, like your HK type stuff and everything. And th- those are nice, and you know, of course, there's much higher than HK. Also, um, you know, Christians and Arms and some of that. You can't like we carry them in our stores, but you don't sell that many of them, right? So that ten percent from your literally like your unicorn type, ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollar guns to your you know several thousand dollar guns is a very small percent. And if you're going to base your company base you know based on that, you're really missing the broader market. And the broader market is your blue collar workers. Or people that just don't, they might be white collar, they just don't have a ton of money to spend on it. But if you can base your sales based on that, and you can provide to them something that they can afford, you're you're selling and expanding our market dramatically. Like if you're focusing on that 10%, what is the 3% of unicorn guns or 7% of just more expensive guns, you can't, it's really hard to expand the hobby. Because if you get someone and like, hey, you know, you should... You should get a gun for self-defense. Here, I've got this $1,500 or whatever gun. They're really not going to be interested. You say, you should get a gun to defend your family, and here's a two ninety nine reliable gun that could get you started. Now, that's the gateway drug, and I say that <laughs> facetiously, but that's what gets them started. But then from there, they might get into the higher-end stuff. So our, our goal has been, while we carry that 10% stuff in our retail stores and online, if we can focus on the 90% of people that needs something that's affordable. First of all, once you get a gun and once you go shooting, like we we've had, you know, news people at our 
at our stores, and we'll always tell them, yeah, we'll let you interview, whatever, but you have to shoot a gun, right? And they go and they shoot a gun on the range, and like, oh, this is awesome, right? Well, more people that have that experience, more people get into the hobby and aren't going to be scared of guns because once they, I've never, unless the person's just being, you know, just petulant, I've never had anyone I've gone shooting with that afterwards wasn't like, that was awesome. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to do that again. They're not scared of it, and it's like an adrenaline rush. And, and so we're just trying to expand that experience for people and make it affordable. And I, I think that's one of the reasons you've seen such an increase in firearms ownership. Not not saying it's because of us, but because there's affordable options out there to get people into the hobby. Well, we just shot a dagger, what, two weeks ago? Two yeah. of them? Yeah, we shot a dagger. Life-changing, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I really I loved it. Yeah. Um, it we shot great. a dagger and the PA-15. Yep. And that was a... a Good time. We did help a friend of ours do a review of one. Um, so you guys have acquired a couple of companies over the last couple of years. Um, mainly you acquired a, the big one, I would say probably would be AAC with the ammo side. Um, and well, then, AAC is two different. So we bought right. out of the Remington bankruptcy. We bought AAC suppressors. Okay. That still operates. It's in Alabama and it's still running. Um, coming out with some new innovations. AAC ammo was is a separate company but w- since we had the rights to the aac initials we thought we would because it kind of fit so america's ammo company it's it's really aac ammo but we use that slogan america's ammo company but that was built in Colum- well it's the right side of the columbia airport in west columbia south carolina but we built that from the ground up okay oh, i didn't realize what? that yeah i yeah. didn't know that either um well what uh then what made you guys decide to get into ammo i know you started out like you wanted to do ammo what that made, was what over was the a point? decade ago okay yeah. so this because i get asked this a lot so we got to a point and you had the big ammo scare yeah. and it was ridiculous we couldn't get ammo to test fire we you know we test fire but you know, depending on the firearm you know from like two to three to ten or twenty rounds on the gun before we ship it and we couldn't get test fire ammo and it was ridiculous and you had Federal is retailing to the public off their website instead of shipping to the dealers and manufacturers. I mean, it was like, call them up, like, hey, we really need some test fire ammo to get these guns out. And they're like, yeah, yeah, machines now. And you're like, come on, you're <laughs> selling it off your website direct to the public. And then you have, so so you had these limitations on ammo. We went through two of them. And I was like, well, that's it. I'm done. We First thing we did was put in a bid to buy Remington ammo out of the bankruptcy. We got stalking horse out of that, so we ended up getting paid that the fact that we didn't win. Vista outbid us. And so then Vista ended up, I was like, okay, well, I'm building an ammo plant like because we are not being able to get ammo. And then I was concerned. I was like, well, if we can't get ammo, American people can't get ammo. And um, you looked at, there was a couple things, you know, you have lately the scare with Lake City, and I'm not sure exactly what's going on there, but, you know, they're selling to the, general public they're not selling to the general public but like say you know all these wars because our ferocious leader biden keeps like letting the world burn but like everybody's fighting a war so like a lot of that ammo goes overseas instead of it would normally go to the american civilian market and then you have this other company czechoslovakian company for whatever reason i hope that they don't let that go through but i mean like federal remington ammo CCI, I mean, there's like American icons, symbols of freedom. They should not be owned by a foreign company. We think about it like, you know, if Lake City gets totally jammed up with military contracts and this, for whatever reason, you know, Vista and their brands can't ship to the American public. I mean, this pub, the, the country is like on the verge of losing their Second Amendment by no ammo. That was what concerned me the most. So we just started it. We were about, unfortunately, about $160 million in on it. And it is... Um, facility is 325,000 square feet. I mean, it's own primer plant. We have three buildings. It's nuts. And if you guys want to come out and do a, a video out there, we'd be more than happy. It's about two and a half hours from here wow. in Columbia. And that was, you know, we take lead ingots and we draw the bullets out. We lead head them, swage them, make our own, you know, pretty much everything. Brass, we draw the brass out. We form it. We load it. Make the primer. We do everything, but we, we don't make powder. Now, um... I want to touch on the the Remington bankruptcy real quick because you guys got AAC out of it, and you also got H and R. Correct. What made you want to get 
the H and R brand. Oh man, I salivated over that one. So one of my <laughs> one of my coolest guns I've ever had. I have an H and R transferable M sixteen A one, and like I mean I I didn't sleep for days when I was trying to get that gun because and I got it at an auction. It's like so beautiful. I still <laughs> look at it and it just makes me happy. Um, and so it's such a cool logo and such an iconic piece of American history. People and, and the museum we're, we're building right down the road from here, you know, there's all these companies from Singer Sewing Machine to AC Spark Plug to, you know, H&R. That, you know, they, they provided freedom for the American people. A lot of them have gone, gone away, right? And to bring back the legacy of H&R, I mean, they made M14s, M1 Garands, and these are hints as to future products. <laughs> they made M14s and M1 Garands and M16s and, Wow, and then just other cool, you know, they made revolvers and single shot shotguns and all that. But I thought, if I could bring that brand back, that's just, it's so cool to be able to bring an American icon back. And it's done very well. One of the first guns I learned on was an H&R single shot. And that, I was going to, you kind of hit the the single shot. I mean, there's no, there's not a lot of companies doing that anymore. And I feel like that's a part of our American histories and, and a step into the gun uh, into the the Second Amendment that we're missing now is the, those single shot shotguns and rifles and things that all those cool little things H and R hey, did over there. It would be really cool if somebody brought a lot of those guns back at some point in the future. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. I wonder if somebody would do that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not, but there's a lot of cool stuff in the works. No. Um, well, well, I'm, I'm excited sure. yeah. for whatever is is coming uh down down the road and and um i will say that for those who i'm sure almost everyone that has listened has been on your website and purchased something from your website and from a goa perspective it has been an amazing journey with you all as uh, a company since we became formal partners and what you guys are allowing people to do, even though it might not seem like a lot to, to people, but by allowing someone to round up on the transaction where all of that money is going into our Second Amendment Preservation Fund, that money is going directly to file lawsuits and to advocate for the Second Amendment. You, There's a dollar amount that's the value, but there's another amount that is is something that we'll never be able to calculate and that is getting people to say potentially for the first time yeah I want to fight for my rights I want to defend my rights and um that's what GOA is all about is the grassroots right and so I want to take a minute to just say thank you because sure well we appreciate what you do for us I don't think people understand because I I spend a lot of time on AR15.com just because I'm trying to get gun owners' perspective. And a lot of the comments, they don't understand how expensive it is to fight the fights that are being waged right now. So when you look at gun control, I think that, you know, liberals, and I said, don't say Democrats and Republicans because liberals in general, no matter what party you're in, they, they would love to ram through something through the House and Senate signed by the president but they're really having a difficult time now and depending on how elections go I, I hope for you know generations to come it's the same way but what they're doing now and it's really dangerous is bump stock ban right mm-hmm. that wasn't passed by anybody that was just an edict given right yeah. and you have brace ban an edict given now you have this more recent changing what is in the business to stop people from having private sales Yeah. Like, you don't have the right to do that, right? As a bureaucrat, and I've actually talked to some of these people, they've sat in our conference room, and one of them said to me, well, it's super easy to comply, just do what we say. And I was like, but you don't have the right to tell anybody that. Like, who are you? You're not a, has to go to the House, the Senate, the President has to sign it. That's how laws are made. But in their minds, and of course I said it professionally because I'm not trying to get arrested, but, (laughs) but, in their minds, they can speak into law by writing a little regulation, right? Mm-hmm. 
That is what the industry is up against right now. And I remember, and we've gotten it because you've seen some of the amicus briefs we've filed, some of the lawsuits we've filed. We we are a part of FRAC, so our lawsuits are generally done through FRAC, but we've done them as JJE, we've done them as PSA, we file amicus when we're trying to help someone out if we think, think we can add to their argument. I remember the first one I talked to the law firm that was doing, and I said, okay, well, you know, we're not rich, so, like, try and keep this cheap. He's like, yeah, I could probably keep it around 300000 I was like, well, do better because that's crazy money. Yeah. And then he's like, no, that's what it costs. And people don't understand that it's expensive, and the government, they have these attorneys that are there just biting you tooth and nail, and they're paid by us. So us, the people on ARFCOM talking about the issues, people buying their groceries, us in the industry, we're paying their attorneys to fight and take away our rights. Yeah. And at the same time, we have to pay our attorneys to, to fight back. And it is tremendously expensive, especially when you think about we're paying both sides from our taxes being taken out. They're, we're paying taxes so the government can take away our rights. Yeah, I mean, I think you said it so poignantly, but you know, when we go back to the, the bump stock, and we look at the fact that we're just now getting to see a case go before the Supreme Court. Um, you know, GOA had filed a case in that, and hopefully we've been able to lay some arguments and pave a way um, for this to have a, a positive outcome. And, um, you know, we won at the lower level and then lost at the, the appeal to the Supreme Court to pick up our case. We're so excited to see something come out, but that has been a long time coming. The same thing with any time you have the ATF redefining something. Um, the lawsuits are expensive, but I will say all of that to say this. Comment periods matter. A lot. And getting pro-gun comments on the ATF pages anytime, whether it's the frame and receiver rule, whether it's the new uh, universal background checks that's currently uh, making its way through um, its comment period, whether it is um, green tip ammo, which we won we based yeah. off of the comments that were made to the ATF. You know, I'm, I'm very proud of, of our members and, and this organization because we put value getting people to make comments yeah. and one and of the big things and I mean, it's a great point but the comments on the original brace ban proposal you know explaining how it's ambiguous and you, they have that that form that sheet and like basically you couldn't figure out what was going on when the ATF actually launched their rule they took all that out and that's part of the flaw they have with the rule is that it's not traceable back to the original rule that they proposed. Mm -hmm. The comment period had them do that and create the fatal flaw. Of course, I don't think it's constitutional, but create the fatal flaw that's probably going to get it totally struck down. Yeah, and furthermore, on the the pistol braces, and I can go on and on and on about this <laughs> yeah. one, um, but um, you know, one of the, the main arguments that the ATF has predicated um, their entire case on is the fact that they have the authority to redefine. And everyone called GOA crazy. You can go back to the Twitter feed and all of the, the comments because we were pushing so hard for the House joint resolution to pass. And um, it was thanks to our members and everyone that took action on that, that it did pass in a bipartisan manner. So we can go back and say, you know what, even the House of Representatives said, right. no, this was not the intent. You, you don't have the authority to do this. Right. And so... It may feel like the death of a thousand cuts, but those sort of fatal flaws, those sort of things that, you know, the, the House of Representatives, everyone who made a comment during that time, all of that gets taken um, into account with these lawsuits. And it what it's what allows us to have a better case. Right. And it, it hopefully will cause us to win um, the ultimate fight when it comes to not only this battle, but future battles, because precedent in the legal system is so vital. And it's one of those um, nuances that not everyone understands because, thank the Lord, not everyone is a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, this is their, their war on, <clears throat> you coined it, 
Kaylee. Uh, ATF's war on plastic when it comes to this, but it's also the war at the dinner table. And we're seeing this with the pistol brace, the bump stock, and now this this new ruling about being an FFL if you sell your stuff and make money. I mean, it's ridiculous. You brought up $6,000 machine guns. Like, imagine if you had a machine gun that you bought really well, and then you go sell it for $60,000, and now you're doing commerce. Yeah, because and now you're a felon. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's interesting. I really like the point where you're heading with it. So when you look, and I look at these, the you know, the, the blogs and everything, people get so discouraged. Like, we're never going to win. Well, if we keep fighting, I actually believe we are going to win. Mm-hmm. It's just the government has the advantage of unlimited money, and they'll just wear you down. I remember talking to the gentleman from the ATF, who had written, who had written some of these rulings and just trying to get inside of his head because he was out doing some sort of inspection. Just wanted to talk to him. And when you hear the the way they think, and which they think that because they don't want you to do it, you shouldn't be able to do it. It's crazy, like yeah. And it's it's easy to comply. Just do that. Like you don't have a right to tell me to do that. They believe that they do. It's very frustrating for the consumer because they think, like, well, what's going on behind the scenes? Well, we're fighting. Lots of us are fighting. It's not just GOA. It's not just JJE, PSA. It's not just Firearms Policy Coalition, the NRA. Sometimes they get a bad rap. They've done some odd things, but they're fighting. But the problem is it takes so long. People tend to disengage and get discouraged. And we haven't won everything just yet, but we're about ready to. I believe we're going to have some serious breakthroughs here soon. Think about, like, the California saw weapons ban, right? Yeah. That was 2018, the original Benitez ruling. It's 2013 now, almost. I'm sorry, 2023 now, almost 2024, six years later. But I think that's going to make it to the Supreme Court, and I think we're going to win. The The government has advantage of unlimited funds, and they'll just wear you down. So the one thing I say, you're right. You have to keep going with the comment period. We have to keep the good fight up and understand that we – if you want your freedom, you got to be more tenacious and more dedicated than the people trying to take it away. Because talking to these people, I've actually talked to the people who are on the other side, and they're belligerent, they're arrogant. They believe that the government, it's almost like their regulations are like, you know, tablets delivered by Moses. They like yeah. literally revere, like it's the Bible, it's the the code of federal regulations. Who cares, right? Yeah. Well, but it's like the code of federal regulation, like like is promulgating these 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 like auras from heaven, right? And it's like, give me a break, leave people alone. And it's not just our industry. You have I've talked to people who are in the banking and finance industry, in the medical community. They're doing it to everyone, and we all need to push back. And we can't give up and get discouraged. I see the comments on, like I said, on air15.com we got to stay in the fight. Yeah. And I think they are counting. I don't think they're counting. I know that they're counting on us giving up, us not educating the next generation, us just taking a back seat to, to the fight. They are expecting what they've always known. And what is so great about gun owners and about what's happening in our community at large is we are welcoming new gun owners in. We're educating them off the bat. We're going into the places that, sorry, we're going into the places that the left, the anti-gun left believes they already own. And I'll give you a, a for example. College campuses have been almost 1,000% owned by the anti-gun left. It has been their safe place. It has been where they they thrive. It's been what they do. And we have a, a college group now that we've started to fight back against that. And I love the fact that they have recognized and that students are recognizing. And we get hundreds of students every week contacting us, trying to, to move up to the next level and, and to fight and to get educated and to get resources out on campuses. And what they're telling us is simple. It is only an echo chamber that they control if we refuse to speak. And how dare we give up on the next generation of gun owners when they're fighting a fight that in many cases 
is more tyrannical than anything we're facing in the general right. public. Yeah, th- this move to control people and what you can do and have a thumb on your life, it's not just gun ownership. Yeah. It's it's everywhere. And there's people that are getting sick of it. They're getting totally fed up. The left is losing the left because leftism used to be, you know, I believe all these crazy loony things because <laughs> I'm obviously I'm conservative, right? So I think what they believe is loony, but it was like, at least when I was growing up and, it was like, I believe what I believe, you believe what you believe, I'll fight to defend your right to believe that, and they would fight for my right to believe that. What the left has turned into now is this, like, thought police. It's actually, if you listen, and I don't agree with Bill Maher's politics, but if you listen to Bill Maher and some of these other people, they're noticing it too. Like, this isn't liberalism. This is, like, it's almost like a cultural Marxism, which is really odd, and it's it's really bad. Uh, you brought up another point, and I just lost my train of thought on it, um, oh, yeah, about, so gun ownership, getting into more non-traditional, you know, you think, like, gun ownership's more like, you know, you know, culturally conservative, white male, and and it has moved into those other areas, and it's really so important. I uh, I did a show one time, and the person that was interviewing me was like, I mean, I could feel their eyeballs rolling in their head talking to me, like, I was, was so below them, they didn't want to talk to me at all. And, you know, they're like, okay, tell me why what you do is important. Like, I roll, I roll. Look, you know, I'm like, because like, they just couldn't wait to just trash me. I said, well, I think everyone should be free. And they're like, okay, sure, whatever. And I was like, no, think about it, right? If we're all free, we're all better off. Think about, like, the Jews in the Holocaust. If they could have been free to own a firearm, they could have held off as best they could or at least had a shot hang out hold off the holocaust right or like slavery like if the poor people that were enslaved in some way defend themselves work together to you know if we're all free we're all better off and the freedom to defend yourself is is a critical freedom and i think people are realizing that you look what happened in israel right the right to defend yourself is a civil right yeah and part of this weird cultural Marxism is you have to think like I do. And I just read a newspaper article in some Israeli paper where they were tr- they were scared that Israeli citizens would end up with guns because someone could get hurt. And like, w- like the mental illness that that takes to think that way. Yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> people just ran through your neighborhood killing you, but you can't have a gun because someone could get hurt. Like, I mean, that's pure mental illness. And it's this cultural Marxism. I'm sure they have the same issues in Israel with it right now that we do. But it's, it's like a, a creeping thing that's coming into people's lives. It's like choking them out, choking out what you can say, what you can think, your ability to defend it. And it is critical because people love to be free, right? And what is freedom? Sometimes you can define it, sometimes you can't. But really, you know when you're losing, you can feel when you're losing your freedom, right? And that message about being free is, it's, it's exciting, right? And so when we get into these other markets, you know, you have like a person in a maybe in an urban area that's not safe. They don't feel safe. What can they do? Exercise some of your freedom. It doesn't mean go do something bad. It just means have the ability to defend it. It's, it's, it makes you feel good again to be free, whether that's freedom of speech, because we do things with the First Amendment too, because mm-hmm. I think the First Amendment's under attack. Yeah. People want to be free. And our goal as a company is to spread more freedom. And the only thing, I, we might be coming to the end of this thing, I don't know, because I talk a lot, but is that we can't give up, right? Yeah. You have to keep going, and it doesn't feel like we're winning, but I really, to most people, but I'm behind the scenes, I'm seeing what's going on in these court cases. I think we are winning. Yeah. No, I mean, I would agree, because you're seeing, if, if the left, if the anti-gun left was winning, we wouldn't see so many people getting trained, getting into gun ownership, and then taking that step, whether it's on a college campus or on an inner or in an inner city. Like those things happen because the movement is the culture is shifting and it's shifting to an understanding that our rights are constitutionally protected. They're not government granted. And it doesn't matter what the bureaucracies want us to believe. That is the truth. Well, I got the the wrap up sign from Ben out there. Um, <clears throat> so let's go ahead and, and wrap this up, Jamin. Really appreciate it. Uh, sure. 
the history Thanks for having me. the history was great the the conversation about pol- uh, policy was great everything was great um where can besides palmetto state armory.com and all your social medias uh do you want to give any hints or anything or this this episode is not going to air until probably late december um, so if you want to give any hints or anything coming up, because we've got that big show in Vegas coming up here real soon. Uh, uh, you guys, you guys going to have to wait. You got to wait. <laughs> <laughs> it's under wraps. It's big, though. We could do a show out there. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do a show. Or, I think, or maybe in the booth. or Yeah. Something. I think we, I mean, I think we could have him on like multiple times. This would yeah. be great. <laughs> no, I really, I mean, I don't think we even scratched the surface yeah. of the amount of information that you have and, and what we can talk about. But I really, we really do appreciate you coming on. We appreciate, like Kaylee said, everything that you've done for GOA and uh, everything you've done for the Second Amendment over the last 14 years. Um, so that's a wrap. Anything you want to say before yeah, we go up? Thanks for having me. It was fun. And let's do it again. Yeah, let's do it again for sure. Kaylee? Sounds good. All right, cool. <laughs> well, thank you guys for watching.